Can it make sense? Right. At least you guys picked a nice casino to go out in, man. I love this. It's very classy. You know, I don't, I don't want to rip on like Vegas or whatever, but the last time I was in Vegas, my wife got excited because we saw Denny's that had slot machines in it. It was like, oh my gosh, you see that? We can gamble at a Denny's. And I was like, big deal. Every time I eat at Denny's, it's a gamble. <laughs> Symptoms from the Pepto Bismol commercial on it. Because you know, like, that's, that's not like here where they just have the slot machines in the casinos, right? You go to Vegas, you find slot machines in gas stations, grocery stores. I was even in the bathroom there once where I had to flush the urinal like this. <laughs> but you know what? Just my luck, that was the one time that I hit the jackpot too. <laughs> Toilet overflowed. <laughs> I like performing at these casinos. Like, you meet me like the weirdest people when you're at a casino. I, mean, I was at the blackjack table earlier tonight. I met this one guy. He kept trying to give me worldly advice that was connected to gambling. And then he was in real like a blackjack. He goes, hey, buddy, remember this one? A 17-year-old girl is like a 17 in blackjack. It doesn't matter how bad you want to hit on a 17. It's never a good idea. <laughs> advice you've ever heard, right? You know, like, the problem with that logic, though, is that in blackjack, you are supposed to hit on a 12. Yeah. And for that matter, you're supposed to double down on an 11. And you're supposed to split eight, so... Uh, I'm gonna go to a comedy show and take stuff seriously. Ooh. Uh, the, the one thing is like the guy who I, I met at the blackjack table, he called himself a professional gambler. Is, isn't that a cool job title, professional gambler? That sounds so much better than saying you're homeless. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what kind of denial are you in at that point? Right? Like me, I don't have a gambling problem. I am a professional gambler who just happens to be a workaholic, that's all. It's not like you can just take a vice and make it your career, right? Like me, I'm not a fan. No, no, no. I am a competitive eater in training. Yeah. Like, no, no, I am not a drunk. I am a bartender who likes to bring my work home. I am not a slut. I am a prostitute who gives out free samples. You can't do that, people. Actually, be in a place where you people can still smoke indoors. I don't get that a lot of comedy anymore. Yeah, I, I, I don't smoke myself, but I love having new smokers in the audience. I really do. I do because I know that if they get mad at me for making fun of them, I can run away. They can only chase me for like 50 feet. <laughs> it's called cardio, sucker. Smokers are fun though, but they always have the greatest excuses for why they smoke. Like, like this, this is my favorite smoker line right here. It's like, yeah, yeah, I smoke, but it's okay because I only smoke when I drink. Yeah, but you're an alcoholic. Uh, <laughs> and even if you're not, what exactly is the logic there? It's okay to breathe in poison just as long as you do it when you're drinking poison at the same time? It's not like two poisons will cancel each other out, okay? just as long as you do it right after you've had unprotected sex with a hooker. I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure trans fat doesn't cancel out a transsexual. I'm just saying. One of the other smoking lines I've heard is like, I smoke because it helps me lose weight. Yeah, well, like, maybe, right? But are there healthier, less disgusting ways to lose weight? Like a tapeworm? smokers anymore because like the big thing is uh, is vaping. Do we have any vapors here tonight? People are, if, you, if you don't know what vaping is, it's, it's for people who want a healthy alternative to smoking but would still like to be annoying to everyone around them. It's, it's not like smoking like smoke out of a cigarette. You basically inhale water vapor that's laced with nicotine out of this little mechanical cigar thing. It's like if somebody combined the sophistication of a hookah with the nerdiness of an asthma inhaler. <laughs> Change that one scene from Alice in Wonderland. What an end is like. Who are you? It's a very obscure reference. Good for you guys for getting it. I, was... I don't 
don't know. I, mean, I, don't, I don't smoke myself. I'm not a big drinker either. Uh, that's mostly just because I'm too cheap for it. That's, that's my thing. Like, my main vices are that I'm cheap and I'm lazy, and every other vice is kind of made moot. I don't like to drink coffee. I know. I know, I know, like, I know, I know that shocks a lot of coffee drinkers. Like, you don't drink coffee. How do you wake up in the morning? Like, I'm a comic. I don't have to. I have to be into work at 8 p.m. You understand? <laughs> Coffee. I, don't, I don't think anyone who drinks coffee likes the taste of coffee. I, I've seen no, I've seen you guys in like the coffee shop. You're like, yeah, I'd like a cup of coffee, but could you fill only half of the cup with coffee? I want to fill the rest with milk and cream and sugar and whipped cream and chocolate syrup and maybe some pumpkin spice because it's the holidays and I feel like that's good. Here's your 2,000 calorie coffee. care of myself though I am I like uh, I'm starting to feel older mostly because my hair started falling out this last year which it's weird like the thing is like no one has ever told me that I'm losing my hair but a lot of people have been hinting that I'm losing my hair which is always so much worse like people would come up to me after a show and be like hey man uh, you ever think about wearing a hat I don't know fat ass do you ever think about vertical stripes uh, <laughs> when we start losing our hair. It is when we go through the five stages of grief over our hair. We do, we do, first is denial. We're like, I'm not losing my hair. And then comes anger. Damn it, I am losing my hair. Bargaining. Well, maybe I can use Rogaine and save my hair. Depression. It's not working. My hair's only growing on my back and my ears. And then finally comes acceptance. We're like, you know what? This is the new me. Bald is beautiful. I'm just going to shake my head and tell people it's a hairstyle. I see like four of you in the audience. <laughs> I'm at that point later this year, I'm just going to walk into the barber and be like, nah, forget the George Clooney. Give me the Patrick Stewart. Make it so. All right, that was for the nerds in the audience. <laughs> Northwest, though, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to uh, complain, but I was in the I was in the South a couple months ago. Uh, not, not the deep South, but the shallow South. It's not as bad. Like there's a difference. Like the shallow South is where people have a funny accent. The the deep South is where people think that I'm the one with the funny accent. Like I, I was in Arkansas a few years ago. Like the deep South, I had a guy coming up to me, be like, "Hey man, how come you talk funny?" Well, you see, sir, my, my father is from Phoenix, but my mother is from Chicago, so they're not related. <laughs> That's how come I talk funny. <laughs> I, I was near Texas, though, man. That's like, that like big pickup truck territory. I mean, I know you guys, like, some of you have some big pickup trucks here, but, like, Texas, they have the ridiculously big pickup trucks. I saw one when I was down there and had like the extended cab, the extended bed, like four foot no way in the world are those street legal tires. <laughs> the whole thing had a suspension that was so high you had a ladder to get in the driver's seat, you understand? This was the best part though, it was parked in a handicapped spot, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had no idea you could qualify for a handicapped license plate just for having a small penis. That is amazing people. <laughs> I have been missing out on some choice parking, I will tell you that right now. <laughs> I come from a land of big pickup trucks, so like, like I said in my introduction, I'm originally from Alaska. Okay, that, that is where I was born, that is where I grew up. And uh, for those of you who are wondering why I don't look like an Eskimo, uh, that is because you are racist. <laughs> coming up to me and be like, you're really from Alaska? Wow, you're pale for an Eskimo. Thank you. You're from California, you're pale for a Mexican. Let's move on. Uh,
it in her muck plugs. That was awesome. <laughs> I don't understand that reference, but okay, good for you. But here, here's the thing, I was just happy to have a girlfriend growing up in Alaska. Here's a fun fact about that place if you've never been there. Alaska has the biggest gender gap of anywhere else in the entire world. This is true, in Alaska, men outnumber women by more than two to one. Yeah, women up there even have a saying about it. They like to say, in Alaska, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. That's not even a joke, that's a real thing that they say in Alaska. The men came up with their own saying. It was, uh, in Alaska, your chances are slim, and the women, eh, not so much. Uh, the northern part of Alaska too, like, like way up there near Fairbanks where it gets to like 65 below zero in the winter time. I'm not making that up either. Like people where I'm from would, would winter in Canada. It was that bad. This time of the year you could actually throw water in the air. It would freeze before it hit the ground. I once spit in a guy's face and chipped his tooth. True story. I drove my car down from Alaska. It has an electric plug sticking out the front grill of the car. A couple of you are nodding your heads because you know what that is. For those of you who aren't familiar, every car in Alaska has this. It's attached to an oil pan heater. So you can plug in your car when it's 50 below zero and your car will still start up, okay? Only people from cold places know what that plug is about. I drove my car from Alaska down to California. Everyone thought I drove an electric. <laughs> Get all these idiot surfers walking up to me, be like, "Whoa, dude! I've never seen an electric Aerostar minivan." <laughs> you are hardcore green, dude. Right on. <laughs> it amazes me, like how little people know about Alaska. I, I kept getting into fights with people who thought Alaska was a tropical island. Those are actual fights I would get into. I couldn't even convince some people they were wrong. They were like, listen, I grew up in Alaska. Trust me, not a tropical island. They were like, oh yeah? Well then why in my high school geography book was Alaska always next to Hawaii in the middle of the ocean? Like, wow, I bet you also think California is purple. Uh, the truth, the truth is like Alaska is not any different from anywhere else in the United States. Most Alaskans, if you want to know, are really just rednecks of the extreme north. That's all they are. You want to know why they have dog sled racing in Alaska? Well, it turns out that is what rednecks do when it is too cold for NASCAR. I, I think the lack of NASCAR is why hockey is so popular in cold places like Alaska and like in Canada. Hockey is the perfect substitute for NASCAR when you think about it. Yeah, the, the, the kind of people who like watching NASCAR just so they can see a car get into a big fiery crash, those are the same people who love watching hockey for the bloody fist fights. Now look at a hockey rink, it's covered with ads just like the cars are in NASCAR. The only difference between the two sports is that in hockey, the players have mullets and are missing teeth. And in NASCAR, those are the fans. And by the way, I can tell that I've just upset a whole bunch of NASCAR fans. <laughs> but I know that if any of you try and chase me after the show, I can just turn right. So. I, grew up, I actually grew up uh, playing hockey though, that was my big sport in Alaska, and I, I know we don't have a lot of hockey fans down here in the lower states. I, I really think you guys should check out hockey if you get a chance to. Check it out, it's a fascinating sport. It is. Even the creation of hockey is amazing when you think about it. Because right? we all know hockey is the most violent team sport that has probably ever existed. But somehow, it was invented by Canadians. <laughs> That's like finding out that smooth jazz music comes from Germany. How the hell did the Canadians come up with hockey? It's like they were just 
drinking one day and decided they were going to mash a whole bunch of sports together. Like, you know what we should do? We should take a boxer, dress him up like a football player, give him a big golf club with a hook on the end of it, then strap a couple of knives to his feet like in a cockfight. <laughs> Shuttle disc into a small soccer girl protected by a guy dressed up like a baseball catcher. It'll be freaking awesome. <laughs> so the only thing about hockey that makes sense that it came from Canada, to me at least, are, are the penalties. Right? Because I mean, if you don't know this, in hockey you can actually hit another man in the head with a hooked stick. And the only thing that happens is you have to sit on a bench for two minutes. <laughs> That is a Canadian idea of a punishment right there. A timeout. You sit there and think about what you did, eh? You feel shame, hoser. The thing is, there are like a lot of sports that don't really seem like they would be popular in the country that they're popular in. Like, like for example, like in Japan, sumo wrestling is huge. Right, sumo wrestling is basically like just two fat guys wearing barely any clothing pushing each other around. How is that not America's number one sport? <laughs> that combines everything we love, overeating inappropriate amounts of clothing and throwing our weight around. Come on! <laughs> I love all sports though. I do. I love playing sports. I don't always brag about this. I actually went to college on a partial sports scholarship. Right. And by scholarship, I mean three hundred dollars. Right. And, and by sport, I mean spirit squad. Yeah, that's right. This is true. My last semester of college, my school paid me three hundred dollars to grab cute little cheerleaders by their butts and throw them into the air. I would have done it for free. I know a lot of guys would never do that. Like, I could never be a male cheerleader, that's gay. I would only play a manly sport like football, where I could wear spandex pants and slap another guy on the ass. <laughs> right before we go take a group shower, you know, something manly. <laughs> and is, I, I don't want to offend anyone. I don't, I'm actually one of those people who hates confrontation. Uh, I, I got into one of those like stupid suburban fights with my next door neighbor last summer, and I, like I hated it. Like my neighbor, this is true. My neighbor got mad at me of all things because he thought that I was spraying too much weed killer on his dog. And <laughs> I did that last year on one of my comedy trips. I was driving cross country. I accidentally hit a dog with my car. Okay, did not kill it, but I did hurt it. And I felt really bad about it. I did really bad, okay? Especially because I hit the poor dog while he was trying to help this blind guy cross the street. <laughs> to the half of the room that didn't get it. That's right. <laughs> well, gonna, I keep getting into these fights with my wife because I'll say the right thing but with the wrong inflection. You know what I mean? Like, like this is true. Like earlier this month, my wife was complaining to me because I was eating too much Halloween or Christmas candy. She, she was like, I wish you wouldn't would eat so much sugar. And what I said to her, I thought was very reasonable. I said, hey, listen, I weigh less now than when we got married. Okay? Unfortunately, the way I said it was, hey, I way less now than when we got married. So I 
I'm in trouble. And... <laughs> My wife and I, we actually did, we, we dated for four years before we got married. Which was, which was really hard for my mom because my mom is a very religious woman and she didn't like the idea of premarital activities going on. So for the entire four years my wife and I were dating, my mom was just constantly like, when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? It's like, I don't know, mom, but when the birth control fails and we have to, I guess. I Could be any day now. You know what it's like when you're living in sin, you know? seconds after everyone else. I know, just... Well, when you laugh, I know we can move on to the next show. Yes? The thing is, like, I, I like being married. I know, like, a lot of people are cynical about marriage in this country. You always, you always hear people say things like, oh, marriage is a failed institution. Half of marriages end in divorce. Right? We've all heard that statistic. This is the part you've never heard of. I looked into it. 80% of people in this country will never, I repeat, never get a divorce. The only reason the divorce rate is so high is because people who do get divorced, on average, will get divorced three or more times in their life. Do you understand? So it's not that marriage is a failed institution, it's just that some people really suck at it. And they keep screwing up do you understand? And by the way, I'm not saying that if any of you have been divorced, that that means you're a bad person or anything, okay? I'm just saying that if you've been divorced three, four, five times, maybe it's you. Statistically speaking, maybe you're the asshole. That's all I'm saying. Okay, we have a solid marriage. Anyway, that's because we're very compatible with each other. I think that's the secret to a good marriage. Compatibility, alright? For, for example, um, my wife loves, loves to stay up late talking after having sex. You know, which is great, because as it turns out, I talk in my sleep. I have a pretty good love life. Uh, this is true. On our last anniversary, my wife told me something that I thought was very sweet. She, she said that uh, every time we make love, it, it's just like our first time. Yeah. Yeah, which means I haven't gotten any better. <laughs> marriage from the wrong angle. Like, especially men, like a lot of men approach marriage like they're buying a car, right? It just it depreciates with value the moment you drive it off the lot and eventually you want to trade it in for a new bottle, right? <laughs> Women approach like a, a marriage like they're buying a house. They're willing to settle for a fixer-upper. <laughs> That's what a lot of women see the potential in <laughs> but That's when they start trying to fix them right away. Like every couple here has gotten into some, like the same fight. I know, like every couple in here at some point, the woman has nagged the man about having skid marks in his underwear. <laughs> that's happened to every one of you, I know. That was like one of the first things my wife tried to change about me. She's like, that is disgusting. You need to do something about it. I don't ever want to see skid marks in your underwear ever again, right? So I changed for her, and I went out to the store and bought myself some brown underwear. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> a lot of the ladies are laughing, a lot of the men are going, brown underwear. <laughs> Let that work. <laughs> Another find that every couple has gotten into at some point is the toilet seat argument. You know? I, know. I, th I thought my wife and I were actually going to avoid that fight because like I said, we dated for four years 
before we got married. And that entire time, not once, did we get in the toilet seat argument. I thought I was in the clear. Oh no. She was saving that one for the honeymoon. Yeah. Very first day of our marriage, my wife came out of the bathroom with a prepared speech. She goes, you know, I would hope that I married a man who is considerate enough to put the seat down when he's done using the bathroom. I mean, I could have fallen in. And I looked at her and I said, well, I would hope that I married a woman who's smart enough not to fall into a toilet bowl. Um, I don't mean to brag, I've been going to the bathroom my entire life. I've been falling in once. <laughs> Look before you leave, see before you squat. What's so hard about that, Brian? It's a huge adjustment, though, when you have to start sharing the bathroom with someone of the opposite sex. It is, especially for men. Especially for men. All that open counter space we had when we were single. Yeah, God, just taken over by little bottles of crap. Stuff starts popping up everywhere. The most expensive crap in the world, too, by the way. My wife and I once got into a fight because she spent $95 on a bottle of makeup, I kid you not, the size of a thimble. Right? And that's not what the fight was about. The, the fight was when I asked my wife why it was so expensive, and she looked at me dead in the eye, and she goes, well, you see, this is worth $95. Because when I put it on, it looks like I'm not wearing any makeup at all. You would because 
babies only have one mouth, all right? But as it turns out, you ladies have two breasts, and guess what? I have two hands, okay? <laughs> that is math. And I'm not anti-breastfeeding, by the way, just in case anyone's wondering, okay? I'm actually very pro-breastfeeding. I am. I believe that every child should be breastfed if possible, okay? That being said, I also believe that no child should remember being breastfed. Can we agree on that? <laughs> Gotta cut that shit off before long-term memories form, you know what I mean? That is the memory that would haunt you later in life, right? When my son becomes a teenager and sees his girlfriend take her shirt off for the first time, he should get horny, not hungry, okay? <laughs> him on his prom night going like, wow, some cookies would be awesome right about now. <laughs> I do have a son though, he's, he's just about to turn uh, five years old, and I also have a daughter who just turned three, and uh, I think if you want to be a good parent, you need to have at least two kids. At least two, because your first kid ends up being a practice kid. That's right. Our oldest is such a practice kid, we should have named him Mulligan. Yeah. That's true for all parents too, by the way. If you are an oldest child, I guarantee your parents made a lot of mistakes when they were raising you. If you are an only child, that means they messed up so bad, they were afraid to try a second time. I think that's why being a parent is so stressful. There's a duality in it. You know it's, you, you know at one hand that it's the most important thing that you are ever going to do with your life. And at the same time, you're almost 100% positive that you're screwing it up somehow. You know what I mean? Like, there are very few parents who don't think that they're screwing it up. And the ones that don't think that they're screwing it up are often the ones who are screwing it up the worst. You know what I mean? Like the kind of parents who brag about how often they hit their kids. You know those parents are like, you're darn right I hit my kids. My parents hit me and I turned out fine. First of all, you did not turn out fine. You turned into the kind of grown-up who brags about beating up a three-year-old. <laughs> I understand it though, I get that, that feeling. Because like as a stay-at-home parent, my job is to suppress the urge to hit my kids until my wife comes home from work to give me a break. That's my job, and that is what I do, by the way, when I'm not doing stand-up comedy. When I'm, not, when I'm not on the road, I'm basically a stay-at-home dad, or as I prefer, trophy husband. <laughs> right. my, my wife says it's not so much a trophy as a ribbon of participation, but whatever. Um, I, th I think being a stay-at-home parent is the hardest job I've ever had in my life. I I've had jobs that are physically demanding, that are stressful deadline jobs, that are gross, disgusting cleanup jobs. Being a stay-at-home parent combines all of those jobs with zero pay. I, I'm, just so, I'm just so glad my kids are finally out of the diaper stage. I actually had to come up with a rule that we weren't allowed to have bubble baths until they were three. That was a rule because bubbles make it too hard to tell when somebody poops in the tub. That's a lesson you can only learn the hard way. You're like, alright kids, let's pick up your bath toys. This one sure is squishy. Ah, oh, crap. Now they need another bath. Actually, it was like, I think potty training was like very difficult for me because uh, by the way, we were able to teach my son how to potty train by teaching him to pee outdoors. So now he loves to pee outdoors, which is great, except that we live in a city. And, you know, peeing on your tree in your backyard is one thing. Peeing on a tree in the Winco parking lot, people will judge the crap out of you, I'll tell you that. My daughter wants to do the same thing too. She's always taking off her pants to go pee outside. Like half the questions I ask my daughter are, where are your pants? It's very disconcerting. Last month she was taking off her pants. I asked her, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to work. Oh. I don't think the hair fall out. Girls, I didn't realize until I had a girl just how different girls are. Right? Even the gifts you get when you have a girl are different. When, when my daughter was born, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law bought her a baby onesie, which read, does this diaper make my butt look big? She had her a gag gift. I thought it was so funny, I bought my mother-in-law the matching t-shirt. And for some reason, she doesn't want to wear it. Yeah. Actually, my 
wife and I are, are good parents because we do the thing that a lot of people do where you, uh, you have a dog before you have a kid to teach you how to be creative with discipline. Anyone else do here do that? I think that should be a law. Shouldn't it be like, you want to have a kid? Well, here's a puppy. If the dog is alive and trained in two years, the dog can get neutered and you can have a kid. If not, you have to get neutered. <laughs> Get rid of deadbeat dads in a single generation. Because having a dog can teach you how to be creative with discipline. It can. My wife and I, our dog is a black lab named Cash. We named him Cash after Johnny Cash because he's the dog in black. Right? Any of you lab owners know this problem though? You come home at the end of the day, the lab likes to jump up on your chest, lick you in the face. Rub, 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 rub. We couldn't figure out how to get Cash to stop doing that. Okay? Until finally I came home one day and I was kind of in a bad mood. He started doing it. Right away, right away, right away. And finally got me so mad, I finally just grabbed his muzzle in my hands, put my mouth on his nose, and went, Stop it! <laughs> That's right, I snarfled my dog. That's what it's called, snarfling the dog. It's where you close your dog's mouth, you blow in your dog's nose, the air goes in your dog's nose, comes out your dog's cheeks like this. It is called snarfling the dog. It is the funniest thing in the world. If you don't believe me, go home, snarfle your dog. You will laugh so hard, you will pee a little. The best part about snarfling Cash is he no longer licks me in the face. Yeah, I'm so proud about myself. I told my wife what I did, and she thought it was disgusting. He was looking at me like, you put your mouth on the dog's nose, you sicko. When did you do that? It's like, I don't know. I guess it was like last night, right before we made out. <laughs> and that was her reaction, too. She got up in my face. How could you do that, you horrible person? Blah, 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 blah. And it finally got me so mad, I just grabbed her head, put my mouth on her nose, and went... <laughs> Before you ladies get mad at me, all right, don't worry. My wife was a smart woman. She knew exactly how to get even. The moment I snarfled her, she blew her nose in my mouth. <laughs> my wife is actually crazy smart. I forget sometimes just how smart she is. Like I consider myself a smart person, but my wife is way smarter. She's a successful businesswoman. And I forget sometimes just how smart she is until we have to make a decision together as a married couple, and I will make the mistake of speaking first. Yeah. That always gets me into trouble. Earlier this year, for example, we did our taxes for the year. We realized we were going to get a little bit of money back when we were done, so we had to decide as a couple how we were going to spend it. And I spoke up first. I go, honey, you know what we should do is invest that money in a PlayStation. <laughs> Which I thought was a great idea, right? But then my wife countered. She's like, well, we could do that. Or we could use it to refinance the mortgage on the house and roll over the monthly savings into a flat stock option, which we flip in the fourth quarter when the holiday bubble is at its peak. And that would give us enough money to pay off the remainder of the car loans and our college fund for the kids with enough money still left over for me to buy some outfits and some makeup and you to get that PlayStation and three games. <laughs> okay, let's do that. I still get the PlayStation though, right? <laughs> Alright, I'll be in the corner coloring. <laughs> My wife is so smart, she speaks three languages. Isn't that impressive? I'm, I'm amazed with anyone who can speak more than one language. I really am. Seriously, I took three years of Spanish when I was in high school. None of it sunk in. Not a bit. Like, I can't even pronounce the entire menu in a Mexican restaurant. It's embarrassing. <laughs> In the restaurant, like, yes, I would like the uh, quesai dial. <laughs> Can I get that with extra cheese? I mean, uh, mucho el chizo. <laughs> Gracias. Uh, <laughs> and I've learned about travels as a comedian that one language thing that's really like kind of unique to North America. And it really is. Like, I was, I was doing comedy in Europe last year. I don't know if anyone here has been to Europe. Everyone in Europe, everyone can speak three or four languages. That is normal for Europe, okay? You come back here to the U.S., most of us only speak one language and not that good. <laughs> He's in point, less than 
than half of you got that joke. <laughs> and that kind of proves my point, because the thing is, the language that we speak isn't even English. Okay, I have been to England. We sound nothing like those people. Yeah, they, they even like to say in England that they speak English, but we speak American. Because apparently American is English minus things like big words and proper grammar. <laughs> Too. Have you ever watched BBC News? It, 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 watch it. It's like, it's like the British version of CNN, but, but it's so much more sophisticated sounding than CNN. They, they, they can have a reporter on the front line of a war somewhere, in the middle of a battlefield. It sounds like masterpiece theater. Like it appears the Alliance of Rebels have been able to fortify their position in this latest military offensive. From our current perspective, we are witness to the sounds of continuous ammunition fire. <laughs> like five feet away is the CNN guy, like, we can hear a lot of gunshots, Wolf. <laughs> Back to y'all. See, this is how I know that I don't speak English that well, is that old English makes my head want to explode. You know what I mean? Like, like every time you hear Sh Shakespeare, you know what I'm talking about? My wish is that every time they came out with a Shakespeare movie, they would include in it a translator for American. Wouldn't that be great? Instead of, instead of a sign language person in the lower corner, give me a white trash redneck guy. <laughs> and just dumbing everything down to my level. How great would that be? Think about it. You know, to be or not to be, that is the question. Should I kill myself? and arrows of outrageous fortune, all to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep no more. Seriously, should I kill myself? <laughs> I'm just saying I've watched that. <laughs> uh, my, my wife is, uh, smart one in our marriage. That's not to say my wife doesn't do stupid things from time to time. She, she has her moments. Like after our second kid was born, she decided she wanted to lose all of her baby weight as fast as possible. So she started going on every diet that you have ever heard of, which meant that I got to go on every diet that you have ever heard of. Apparently I had a baby. And I'm not joking, for six months my wife and I, we did every diet. You've heard of the caveman diet? We did that one. The blood type diet, we did that one. We even once did a diet where we could only eat foods that we could spell using the letters in our names. <laughs> that diet sucked for me. My name is Ryan, so for a week I ate nothing but yarn. <laughs> as bad as that was for me, it was even worse for my wife, though. You know, like I said, she did the diet with me, and her name is Tish. <laughs> Ton, all right, moving on. Where's your friends can explain it after the show? So, anyways, man, you guys are a fun crowd. Thanks for coming out. Uh, before I get off stage, I want to talk about something fun, something universal, something we can all get behind. Uh, religion. Just wanted to see how tight I can get those butt cheeks. <laughs> And don't worry, I'm not going to make fun of anyone's religion, okay? I know religion is different for everyone. I myself found Jesus recently. Uh, not, not the Jesus, but a Jesus. He delivered a pizza to my house. And I thought they probably pronounced it Jesus, but the name tag read Jesus, okay? I'm sorry, I count that as a spiritual experience. I really do. I do. Especially because my single order of breadsticks ended up feeding 50 people. So that's a Bible joke. If you didn't get it, it means you're going to hell. And, uh, don't worry, I'm not judging you, okay? I haven't read the Bible either because I'm Catholic. I, I was raised a very strict Catholic. The church I went to growing up had an Irish priest. That's how Catholic it was. I, I even remember his name. It was uh, Father Pat O'File. <laughs> Bishop's name was Luke Dayetaway, and, uh, 
He sucked at his job, I'll tell you that right now. shouldn't joke about religion, and I call those people my mom. Uh, I just think there are some things about religion that are just inherently funny. I mean, does anyone else here ever wonder if Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses ever get into holy turf wars with each other? You know what I mean? Like a religious game fight to see who can solicit on the east side? <laughs> Baptisms where they just throw water balloons. Real 